Good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased and honored to welcome uh, Danny Roderick to deliver the uh, Jean Monnet lecture on the real world economics of globalization. Uh, I think it's fair to say, as a matter of introduction, that uh, Danny has uh, shaped the way we think about uh, the interaction between trade and development and then development economics more generally. Um, you're probably one of the very few scholars who can address uh, the, the multiple dimensions of, of globalization uh, across all dimensions, trade, finance, uh, and uh, importantly, uh, the uh, political economy underpinnings of globalization, which I'm sure you're going to uh, address uh, tonight. Uh, and uh, these are all matters which really uh, 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 underpin, shape, uh, uh, impact a lot of what we're doing here at the ECB, so I very much look forward to listening to you. And um, we'll have time to uh, interact uh, with the audience uh, at the end of your, uh, of your lecture. So thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Benoit, um, uh, uh, for the, uh, the invitation and, and for uh, asking me to um, to give this this uh, this lecture. Thank you also, Luc Levin, um, for 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 the invitation. Um, uh, giving this lecture associated with Jean Monnet's name is 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 um, a, 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 a true honor. I've always thought of uh, the European Union as the. Um, um, as, as the premier act of uh, institutional engineering uh, in the post-Second World War uh, period of the world economy. Um, and and uh, no one uh, worked harder uh, to make that happen than, than Jean Monnet. And in, in part uh, stimulated by this invitation, I read um, uh, his biography recently, autobiography, and it's, it's really quite quite striking the amount of energy um, he devoted shuttling um, among the various European capitals um, and, and trying to get all those uh, political ducks to line up uh, to make, um, to advance the process of, of uh, European integration. Um, uh, he always maintained his hope uh, and this, this optimism that in fact Europe would uh, uh, end up integrating politically uh, and not just uh, economically. Um, and I think uh, um, uh, it, it's a hope that uh, um, seems to have received um, uh, a few negative shocks recently, but um, um, uh, I personally hope uh, that, that that hope will be uh, fulfilled uh, at, at some point. Um, so um, thanks again for, for, this, for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to be talking um, about um, uh, I gave the title Real World Economics of, of, of Globalization, um, and that may um, sound a little bit like I'm going to be suggesting um, that um, you know, there is the economics of the seminar room or the conference room, like what we've been having here, and then there is the economics of the real world, and those two are uh, quite different things. Um, actually, I'm going to suggest something very different, that uh, um, the, 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 you know, sort of the way that globalization has worked out uh, is pretty close to what some of the uh, uh, first principles of economics uh, would have told us, um, and uh, that uh, um, and, and perhaps we should not have been surprised by the political backlash uh, as much as we have. Um, uh, I think one of the, the, the key uh, teachings of um, uh, conventional trade theory is that uh, 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 stark uh, redistribution or sharp amounts of redistribution is really the flip side uh, of the gains from trade, um, uh, particularly um, uh, during the advanced stages of globalization when barriers tend to become small. Um, uh, I think thinking about many of these issues of compensation would have made us fairly skeptical uh, about the possibilities of compensation, uh, both for um, economic and political economy reasons. Um, looking closer at uh, the kind of globalization we're having, would understand that it um, created uh, a second layer of issues having to do with um, uh, institutional arbitrage and the clash of values that that generated. So it went beyond simply income redistribution. Um, 
And so all, all these considerations then sort of um, really um, I'm going to, which I'm going to be developing um, uh, and going over then suggest sort of the final question that I'm going to ask if, you know, if, if all of this should have been obvious, um, why um, didn't we pay more attention uh, to in fact what our teachings um, uh, predicted? And so I want to end um, the talk uh, with a few uh, comments about where I think um, economists um, have gone wrong uh, in the hope that maybe there are some lessons here for, um, for, 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 the, for the future. Uh, but I think it it's, 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 uh, might be useful to start uh, with a little bit of uh, a historical detour, um, um, going all the way back to uh, the end of the 19th century, uh, because it's a way of uh, uh, making a couple of connections. One is to underscore that, in fact, uh, uh, Populism is not something that is new. Um, in fact, um, the very first uh, self-consciously uh, populist movement, political movement uh, in history, um, uh, developed in the late 19th century uh, in the United States. Uh, it was the People's Party. Um, uh, William Jennings Bryan, uh, who ran uh, for the presidency twice for the Democratic Party, was very much uh, a, a symbol of the populist and spoke for the People's Party. Um, and, uh, and, and many of the um, uh, the complaints of the populists and the populist movement was based essentially um, uh, among the, um, arose out of the uh, um, difficulties and the uh, complaints that farmers in the southern and western parts of the United States had uh, because um, they um, uh, were highly indebted during a period of def price deflation, um, and they felt uh, had very high real interest rate burdens, and they blamed um, the Northeastern capitalist and financial establishment, um, and of course, uh, the gold standard um, for their problems, because the gold standard was a conveyor uh, through which um, the, the um, uh, 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 price deflation was transmitted into their um, into into farm prices and the decline in in, in corn and wheat and other uh, commodity uh, prices, um, and so there you know we can see from that very first episode of, of the rise of populism that there was a connection between advanced stages of globalization here, um, the gold standard and and um, and the kind of sort of you know populist movement uh, that that uh, rose in response. Um, this, this bit of a of a of the quote that you, I'm sure um, you all are familiar with, and it's probably the most famous piece of political oratory in, in U.S. Uh, history, this famous statement, you shall not crucify mankind uh, upon a cross of gold. Uh, so it was this early uh, cry from the heart uh, against what uh, today we would call policies of austerity, um, and sort of making the tight connection between um, uh, um, a hyper-globalized system of international finance um, and uh, the rules that that imposed on national economic uh, uh, outcomes um, and the distributional consequences that it had on, on, on uh, large segments of society. Um, but let me come back to um, the, uh, um, the, the, the present and in particular sort of the main, the main theme of, of my talk, which is um, sort of, you know, what uh, does global, what does basic economics say um, uh, about um, opening up and, and globalization? Um, and I would say that the, 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 there, are, there, are th there are three key things that uh, you know, we typically stress, um, where actually you know, sort of we, we stress in, in decreasing order of significance. Of course, the first one uh, of these things is that there are gains from trade, that uh, reducing barriers at the border generally enlarges uh, the economic pie. Now, uh, there are all kinds of caveats here. If, if uh, you're not in perfect competition, there are externalities and so forth, but leaving those caveats aside, there's a pr strong, pr strong presumption of gains from trade. Uh, from the basic uh, competitive model. Uh, but secondly, that in fact, um, in virtually every model of uh, um, uh, uh, gains from trade or comparative advantage that we work with, uh, with, the with the 
possible exception of single mo factor models like the Ricardian model, uh, that we're not going to get everyone uh, to actually uh, win, and that are going to the different parts of, of um, a society that's going to be worse off. Um, I'll come back to this in a second to emphasize the, um, uh, the generality of this result. Um, and, and, and third, uh, that in, in the standard uh, competitive uh, benchmark model of the gains from trade, that in fact the amount of redistribution that uh, one gets relative to the net gains or relative to the gains from trade become larger and larger uh, in the advanced stages of globalization or as uh, the barriers that we're going after to remove become smaller and smaller. Uh, so I think that, that, that last point in particular, I think, has some relevance to why um, uh, advanced stages of globalization become politically more contentious, because often it turns out that their first-order first impact is more likely to be redistributive uh, than, than net uh, gain uh, creating. And that, of course, is going to have some implications for possibility of, of compensation, uh, which I'll come back to uh, in a letter uh, later. But let me just say a little bit about uh, the stark distributional um, effects, because I think um, uh, uh, it's not always understood how general those distributional effects are. Um, of course, the, the key um, uh, paper here is the famous uh, Stolper-Samuelson theorem from 1944, uh, which proved um, that uh, not only that there were relative um, losses and gains, but that in fact there were absolute uh, losses and gains, that in this particular case, in a two by two model, two factors of production, uh, two goods, and the factors of production perfectly mobile uh, between the two sectors, that owners of one of the two factors of production would be made necessarily worse off with the opening of trade. So it's not that just one group, let's say unskilled workers, become relatively worse off, or that they're not getting most of the gains, they get small, some of the gains, and in fact, they're absolutely uh, worse off, um, that they're in real terms, uh, that, they've, um, that they've lost up. Now, um, the point about this theorem is that, in fact, uh, even though this one, uh, Stolper and Samuelson proved it um, in a very specific kind of a uh, context where you have only two goods, two factors, and perfect mobility of factors, uh, it is actually one that generalizes uh, um, very, very um, easily uh, to, in fact, a much broader set of circumstances. Um, and this generalization states, and really the generalization um, uh, relative to the sort of, com you know, the, the competitive benchmark, the only thing that it really requires uh, is that the importing country continue uh, to produce the imported good. In other words, that you, you're, you don't have complete specialization, uh, that as long as that happens, there's always going to be uh, at least one factor of production that is rendered worse off by the liberalization of trade. So the Stolper-Samuelson theorem generalizes quite to a very wide range of circumstances uh, as long as there is some overlapping of domestic production or very, very close substitutes uh, with imported uh uh, consequences, imp imported uh, commodities, and, and this is uh, really a consequence of what trade theory is called the, the magnification effect, that is that, um, that the uh, factor price consequences are magnified uh, relative to relative prices. Um, and, the, uh, the, the, and, and, and the question of, of sort of what kind of distributive margins uh, will these distributive effects um, uh, operate is very much a function of how we divide up the economy, whether we think of different factors or different regions, different communi communities, increasingly in, in, in models with heterogeneous firms, of course, different types of firms. Uh, so these uh, gains and losses will be also distributed unevenly amongst them. Uh, but this specifying those margins uh, is obviously very, uh, specifying the right margins is obviously quite important in empirical work. And I think one reason that early work by trade economists uh, missed out uh, some of these large distributional effects was that it focused on relatively um, large aggregates of skilled versus unskilled. And that the reason that the more recent work um, uh, uh, um, has uh, 
found bigger effects on uh, the distribution is that they actually look at, a, at sort of another margin that seems to matter more empirically, which is that focusing across communities. And it turns out that labor, even in the United States, is not that mobile across uh, uh, spatially. Um, so uh, some point number one here is, is just this um, uh, distributional effects are real. Um, sort of, you know, the, the very get, the very models um, that we use to teach our students and, and inform the rest of the world about the wonders of comparative advantage and the gains from trade almost necessarily imply very stark distributional effects that some people will be worse off. Um, furthermore, um, the uh, um, the magnitude of these distributional effects uh, tend to rise relative to the gains from trade um, as um, uh, we advance uh, in globalization or as the barriers that we're removing become smaller and smaller. Um, and that really is, is, is a, a, a consequence of you know, st st straightforward you know, public finance um, uh, economics, which is that, that when you think about trade, uh, tariffs on trade or trade restriction essentially as a tax, it's a tax on trade, and we know that the, the cost of, of, of taxes rise with the, or the efficiency costs rise with the square um, um, of, of, of the tax rate. So as the tax rate or the tariff that we're removing becomes smaller and smaller, um, the net gains from trade that we're generating become uh, you know, disproportionately smaller. Uh, whereas the distributive effects uh, that we generate are, are approximately linear in the change in relative prices. So in fact, uh, the effects on redistribution be remain linear, uh, whereas the gains uh, become sort of disproportionately smaller. So if you calculate this simple ratio of what I once called the political cost-benefit ratio uh, of uh, uh, opening up, which is assume all redistribution is politically costly, so you put it in the numerator, and you put in the denominator the net gains from trade. So the political cost uh, benefit ratio is the is the absolute the sum of absolute redistribution that is done relative to the net gains from trade, uh, this ratio becomes larger and larger um, as uh, we end up uh, uh, chasing smaller and, and smaller uh, uh, barriers. Um, how much? Well, I'll just show you a couple of very simple uh, kind of back of the envelope uh, type of calculation just to see how outsized uh, these effects are uh, before I turn to some of the empirical work um, that, that you might already know. Uh, one is in this, the simplest case, if you look at the, the, the effect of a tariff uh, in, in, a, in a very par in partial equilibrium, um, and, and there it, it's very easy to relate this uh, ratio of redistribution to efficiency to three parameters only. Uh, these parameters are the, uh, the share of imports in GDP, uh, the import demand elasticity, and the size of the trade barrier itself. Uh, it turns out that the political cost-benefit ratio is just going to equal to the inverse of the product of these three parameters. If you look at the table there as to what happens as we reduce uh, the tariff that we are uh, eliminating, uh, going from 40% tariff to about a 10% tariff, this political cost-benefit ratio really becomes very, very large. By the time uh, the tariffs are at the level of 10%, which, by the way, is already higher um, than what manufacturing tariffs are presently, uh, this um, uh, uh, political cost-benefit ratio is already at the level of 20. And what 20 means is $20 of income is being reshuffled uh, across different groups per $1 of net gain that is being generated. Um, in general equilibrium, you get sort of very similar uh, kinds of, 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 uh, of results. So here, if you look at, this is a very simple, just a simple two-sector model. Uh, but if you just simply calculate uh, the proportional change in the wages of low-skilled workers relative to the uh, overall uh, real income increase in the economy uh, that rises uh, from, a sec from a ratio of about five to a ratio of almost 80, um, uh, once you go from 40% tariffs to about 3% tariffs. All of this is just follows you know, straightforwardly from the very standard assumptions of the, of the, of the um, uh, baseline uh, competitive uh, uh, model, um, the one that we teach comparative advantage with. 
Now, um, there has been now, as, as I'm sure you know, sort of a, a number of empirical papers that have looked at uh, retrospectively on some of the major uh, trade shocks that an economy like the United States has experienced. We have some evidence on NAFTA. NAFTA was a very, very small potato for the U.S. economy as a whole uh, because Mexico is relatively small and U.S. tariffs were already pretty small relative to Mexico to start with. Uh, so if you were looking for the effects of NAFTA on the U.S. economy as a whole, uh, if you ask what are the net gains from trade or the overall efficiency gains, basically people have had very hard time uh, uncovering uh, or finding out um, a very um, uh, significant effect. So the, the most recent and the most sophisticated work on this uh, finds that the, uh, the net gains from trade that is created for the United States from NAFTA for the economy as a whole was of the order of 0.04 percent, 0.04 Zero four percent, so even you know less than half of one percentage points of of, of GDP. About a recent study by. Um, uh, Hakopian and McLaren finds that the relative wage effects, in fact, were very large. Um, uh, in fact, a um, couple of orders of magnitude larger, um, that wage growth in the most affected industries uh, was reduced by about 17 percentage points in the most affected um, uh, uh, um, communities by about uh, 10 percentage um, uh, um, uh, points. So this, these are the, the communities or the um, uh, industries that were the most exposed to opening up to trade to Mexico, where it had the initial tariffs uh, were uh, the highest relative to uh, um, uh to start. Of course, the, the much better work, uh, much probably much better known work of uh, author and, and um, co-authors on the, on the China shock, um, uh, and, and they found that um, large uh, employment effects um, that were not only significant, but also they find actually quite um, uh, quite significant, quite uh, sustained uh, over uh, a decade, a decade or more, so that these employment effects um, lasted um, and and had significant um, effects uh, well into um, a decade um, uh, later. Um, if we want to understand, of course, uh, sort of the distributional effects uh, of, uh, of, of globalization, uh, we need to go beyond the, uh, the conventional comparative advantage models of trade and goods. Uh, but of course, increasingly, globalization also became uh, a, a kind of um, a, an asymmetric uh, opening up of the world economy, uh, where uh, capital, both physical and financial capital, uh, became increasingly mobile, uh, while labor uh, be was, uh, um, for the most part, um, was um, was heavily heavily controlled, um, and. Uh, uh, there are sort of, you know, immediate implications of this uh, asymmetry, and there are a number of, of uh, empirical papers that have started to, um, to to look at these. But again, simply on the basis of, of um, first principles of economics, so if you look at sort of what would be the implications of this kind of asymmetric mo mobility, uh, you'd you'd conclude that there would be uh, significant distributional Im impacts in terms of um, uh, those industries where bargaining or rents were important in terms of the distribution of the enterprise surplus uh, between capital and labor, between employers and their workers. Um, there would be significant impact on the incidence of shocks as sort of, you know, with capital being able to uh, sort of mobile across borders. And of course, there would be significant impact uh, on who bore, uh, um, who was bearing uh, the tax burden, um, and the tax burden would shift uh, from, from capital uh, to labor. And of course, you know, um, anyone who's uh, familiar with what has happened uh, to um, uh, the uh, corporate income taxes around the world, uh, the explicit manner in which uh, um, tax corp corp uh, competition has been used as an excuse for reducing uh, uh, corporate taxes, most recently, of course, in the United States, uh, is aware, and of course, the work, important work of Gabriel Zuckman and his various co-authors uh, shows the, the relative importance um, of, 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 of this. Um, uh, there's a, uh, I just want to show you um, a couple of slides from a, a, a recent um, uh, interesting work um, at the IMF. 
uh, that looks sort of in some way summarizes um, the kind of, of you know, theoretical or conceptual points um, that I've been making uh, with respect to the uh, effects of, of globalization, uh, both on inequality and on the gains uh, from trade. So this, uh, with respect to inequality, uh, looks at the effect of inequality, which is um, the vertical axis, uh, um, against the measure of how globalized uh, a nation is. Um, and, and the key finding here is that the more globalized you are, uh, the, um, uh, the more adverse the impact of, of uh, um, globalization uh, on your domestic uh, income distribution. Uh, this one uh, looks at the effects of the, the growth benefits of globalization. How much growth do you get uh, from globalizing? And, and it shows nicely sort of this uh, diminished uh, return, diminishing returns to globalization, that the uh, returns to globalization are greatest uh, when you're relatively um, little globalized, uh, but they tend to converge towards zero when they're, you're very highly uh, globalized. Um, now, when we talk about these distribution effects. One reason uh, that um, I think economists uh, don't pay much attention to these distributional consequences, and I'll come back to this, uh, is because in the back of our mind, we have this notion that if the, if the pie is expanded, if there are net gains uh, from trade, uh, that, that those gains could be redistributed, uh, that there could be compensation. Um, and then this possibility of compensation uh, allows us uh, to focus on the efficient consequences. Uh, but uh, we know that uh, compensation, uh, you know, is is, is, is likely to be distortionary uh, on its own account, that lump sum transfers are not going to be uh, possible. And therefore, in practice, compensation is going to involve economic distortions uh, in, at several margins. Uh, there's only one paper that I know that has actually looked seriously at this in terms of uh, what would you suppose that you were actually compensating individuals through the tax system and that these taxes were affecting um, uh, labor supply or other other uh, irrelevant um, uh, distortionary margins, um, how much would it eat up from the net gains from trade to compensate uh, the losers? Um, and, and this paper by Paul Antras and, and co-authors uh, finds that a uh, significant amount, in this case about 20% of the gains, uh, would be eaten up. Uh, I would say that this is a, a, a kind of understatement because of the way that um, actually uh, uh, trade barriers are treated in this paper because they are, they are simply of, of, of the iceberg variety. So the revenues that are created by tariffs or quantitative restrictions, those themselves are not taken into account and putting them back in uh, would create larger ones. Um, if you just simply look at, if you take go back to the kind of simulations I presented about how in our simple baseline or benchmark models, how much redistribution we get per efficiency dollars, per efficiency gains, um, and, and you, 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 you put in very um, sort of um, uh, moderate um, um, uh, values for the excess burden of taxation, such as you know, 10 cents on the dollar, uh, then in fact uh, it's very easy to get to the point where you're eating up more than the gains from trade uh, just to compensate the loser. So that, you know, that, that simply from the perspective of feasibility, uh, when you get to the advanced stages of globalization, it becomes uh, very, very difficult to actually undertake uh, that compensation. And there's of course a further problem with respect to compensation. Uh, with which is that typically compensation uh, turns out uh, not to be time consistent. Uh, this is very clear in the case of the United States, uh, where the, the um, compensation takes in the form uh, takes the form of trade adjustment assistance. And every time the United States uh, signs on a trade agreement, workers are uh, promised compensation through a tr particular or an expansion of a trade adjustment assistance. Now, of course, the problem with this is, you know, is, is, a, is a typical political economy time inconsistency problem uh, that once the trade agreement is signed, signed and therefore the status quo is 
almost irrevocably altered. Of course, we know with Trump that you can uh, get out of trade agreements, uh, um, but uh, um, uh, it is not costless. Um, and therefore, what that means is that you've actually uh, irrevocably also changed the, the nature of the political game. And it's going to be very difficult for that. Uh, the, 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 pro the, the, the incentive to carry out that promise is not going to be uh, carried out. This is, by the way, exactly what has happened uh, with the way that TAA, or Trade Adjustment Assistance, has worked out in the United States, uh, that Congress re repeatedly has, um, has not provided the kind of funding uh, that would make, make TAA a, a, an adequate compensation mechanism. Um, and uh, every study that I've seen um, shows that the TAA, as a result, um, has been really a very ineffective kind of compensation mechanism. That doesn't mean that compensation never works. I think, in fact, it works in Europe, and it has traditionally worked in Europe, uh, but it's worked when it is part of a, a kind of a political settlement uh, or a constitutive political bargain, and therefore is embedded uh, in the uh, social policies of the country, so that in, in, the United, in, in Europe, of course, as you know, there isn't separate adjustment assistance uh, policies for the losers, um, and the, the losses are taken care of uh, through the uh, welfare state arrangement. And because they are embedded in the welfare state arrangement, um, then, uh, then to some extent, of course, you overcome this time inconsistency problem uh, of compensation. Uh, but of course, these welfare state arrangements in turn have become uh, um, um, have become weakened uh, in recent years because of, uh, in no small part, because of the, um, uh, the difficulty of taxing capital and employers in a world with um, uh, um, uh, financial uh, um, and capital mobility, where the tax burden has shifted increasingly uh, onto, the la onto labor, and it's become much more difficult to sustain these generous uh, compensation mechanisms. And in turn, uh, there's work, of course, that shows that the weakening of these safety nets in part um, uh, helps explain some of the rise of nativist or extreme right uh, parties. Um, this wasn't uh, just sort of a kind of a textbook, textbook globalization. Uh, this was a, 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 a globalization that also went significantly in the direction of what we, one might call um, a kind of a skewed um, institutional um, uh, um, arbitrage. Uh, that uh, if we think about of this traditional model of trade liberalization under the GATT system being a model of what my colleague Robert Lawrence calls shallow integration, that is that you, you basically are going after barriers uh, at the border, uh, the trade barriers, import tariffs and non-tariff barriers. Increasingly, uh, globalization or trade agreements um, and financial globalization became about rewriting uh, the rules behind the border. Um, and so that was sort of a more of a deep integration uh, kind of a model. Um, and uh, when you think about sort of what that, what that kind of, of um, institutional arbitrage does is it often um, creates uh, clashes in values about sort of who's going to have property rights over who writes the regulations, uh, the value of, of institutional diversity, uh, the value of democratic voice in setting your own regulations and so forth. And that those are the kinds of things that uh, are not properly or adequately or legitima legitimately uh, addressed through uh, um, uh, 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 compensation or financial transfers because they're much more sort of uh, entail clash uh, in, in, in values. Um, and I think here it's, it's something that maybe is a little bit uh, further away from the first principles of economics, but I think it's only a kind of a, a slight um, uh, extension of our horizon that when we think about the kind of uh, fairness uh, issues that arise in the context of, of um, uh, institutional uh, arbitrage uh, is that there's, there's a very, there's, there's a very big difference between uh, certain types of trade um, that takes place across a national border versus a trade or an exchange that takes place in a domestic market economy. Because in a domestic setting, uh, there is a level playing field in terms of two competitors, A and B, uh, operate under the same ground rules, under the same set of, of uh, legal and institutional um, uh, uh, setting. But when one of those firms, B, uh, 
uh, interacts with a firm in C across the border in some other setting, uh, there's necessarily both a kind of gains from trade, which is uh, the one that I've been talking about, the conventional gains from trade, but there's a second effect that comes from a uh, kind of, of, of institutional arbitrage that to some extent that trade or outsourcing is a channel uh, through which some of the um, institutional arrangements in the other country, in the home country of the exporter, uh, is uh, uh, seeps back uh, into, the, into, the, um, uh, um, in, into the importing country. And you can see that in terms of, of uh, sort of, I've already mentioned the corporate uh, uh, tax um, uh, competition, uh, but there are implicitly all of these channels in terms of, of how you deal with um, sort of financial arbitrage or regulatory arbitrage, in terms of arbitrage in domestic norms about how you deal with workers, what's an acceptable redistribution, sort of employee employment uh, norms, labor standards, and so forth. And sort of all these, I think, raise legit legitimate concerns about whose standards should apply, whether it is the um, home country standards or the host countries. And of course, this is an issue that the European Union is very familiar with. Um, and occasionally, the European Union has, in fact, as in the case of the posted workers uh, agreement very recently, has actually decided to settle that it would be um, the, um, uh, the, um, the um, host country uh, uh, rules that would apply, even if uh, you would actually um, undercut some of the conventional gains from trade as a result. In other words, Polish workers coming into France would ha temporarily would have to operate under uh, French rules. Uh, that re reduces the gains from trade. It's sort of like saying, um, you know, uh, uh, goods produced uh, in China or in Cambodia or in Myanmar um, have to be pr produced with labor standards. Um, that uh, um, apply in Europe or in the United States. Um, so it does reduce the gains from trade, but it's a way of dealing with this kind of, of uh, institutional arbitrage. Um, there is evidence that, in fact, people see these different kinds of trade um, uh, differently, um, uh, and, and they have different views on how governments should respond. So from an economist's perspective, whether a worker gets displaced because of some demand shock or some technology shock uh, um, or some trade shock shouldn't matter. Uh, if a worker is displaced, um, you know, you deal with it. Uh, if you think you should provide compensation or social insurance, you do it, but you don't really ask why did that worker get displaced in the first place. Uh, in, in the real world, I think people care about this. Um, recently, um, uh, uh, Rafael Ditella and I um, ran a, a, a survey where we asked um, respondents uh, to respond uh, to a um, a variety of different kinds of shocks. We gave them a newspaper story about a factory closing and, and workers being at risk of losing their jobs, and each one of these treatments uh, gave a different story uh, about what the source of the shock was, and those shocks are shown at the uh, horizontal axis. One of them is simply technological change, automation, Another one is a kind of a demand shock where um, there are changes in consumer tastes. A um, third one was a case of bad management. The plant might close because the managers had made mistakes or mistakes. And the, second, the, uh, the, the, the last two were trade shocks. One was a trade with a, a developed country and the last one was a trade with a developing country. Um, and what's striking is in fact how different, how diverse were the responses uh, of the respond of, in in terms of whether uh, there should be any compensation at all, uh, whether the government should help those who were losing their jobs, and whether government should respond by providing import protection. Uh, two things, one is that what's striking is that it, when the firm, the, the treatment is a kind of a trade shock, not only um, were uh, respondents not interested in providing financial compensation. In fact, their uh, willingness to provide financial compensation relative to the control case actually dropped. And all, all of these results are statistically significant, by the way. So when you're dealing with trade shocks, you know, uh, somehow uh, the, the conventional moral intuition of the ordinary sort of uh, um, uh, respondent is that you don't deal with uh, these with, with trade shock, with, with compensation. How do you deal with it? In fact, you 
deal with it very much through protection. And the second point, of course, is that um, there's a big difference, um, uh, uh, quite significant difference between how they respond to trade with a developed country as opposed to trade with a developing country, uh, that the trade with a developing country calls uh, forth for a much more protectionist response relative to trade with a developing country. So now, um, let me, um, after you know, having suggested that that uh, that you know, in, in some, in in a, in, a, in a real sense, many of these um, uh, uh, sort of. Uh, you know, the political consequences uh, can be read off uh, from uh, some of the first principles or implications or, or relatively minor extensions of the kinds of things that, that, that we teach. Um, why, um, why, in some sense, were we not better citizens? Um, we should have known better. So I think there's, there's, in a way, there's sort of, you know, two smaller questions in this. Uh, where um, did we go wrong? Um, and secondly, maybe more controversially, why did economists, uh, you know, sort of become cheerleaders for the wrong kind of globalization? Because you can imagine globalization that was more balanced, one that um, uh, sort of, you know, really took compensation seriously, um, and one that uh, ensured that the rules did, in fact, um, uh, ones that were broadly beneficial. I, I, I want to say just just two points uh, in, in 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 closing um, uh, as to why uh, sort of how I think about this. Um, one is that I think there was a what I would call a kind of a naive political economy model uh, in our minds, in the minds of, so, you know, this is maybe more true of international economists in general, in trade economists in particular. Um, and um, so this was, I say naive because in some sense it was never uh, made explicit, and making it explicit maybe would have made us a little bit more cautious. This was brought to, to mind, uh, sort of brought home to me when um, uh, I wrote this little monograph two decades ago um, that was called "Has Globalization Gone Too Far?" and I and, and sent it around to a bunch of economists and 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 one sort of very liberal in the U.S. sense and and sort of um, uh, economist sort of came back to me and said, um, "Well, this is all, all 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 seems fine, but don't you think you're going to be giving ammunition to the barbarians?" Um, so the, the story was that you know that there were you know, barbarians on this other side who were the protectionists, um, and some, by expressing some skepticism or doubts, very much along the lines of what I've been talking to you about, that this was going to be providing ammunition to the to the barbarians. So what is the model? What is the explicit political model, political economy model under which that makes sense? I think the kind of implicit model that that many of us or many economists carried in their mind was that uh, you have a bunch of rent seekers, um, self-interested rent seekers, uh, but that this, these, these groups are, are, are almost uh, inherently uh, on the protectionist or the anti-globalization side, uh, that these protectionists are the politically dominant force, um, and therefore the resulting political economy equilibrium is biased towards too little globalization. And therefore, leaning on the globalist side, sort of leaning against the wind, so to speak, uh, is almost is almost always desirable from the economic perspective. So this is the underlying political economy model. Um, but you know, I, I think you know, in the real world, there are really barbarians on both sides of the issue. Uh, so you know, I think you know, if you know, the the, the kind of the, the multinationals, the pharma groups, or the uh, the international investors, or the, the the bankers who are pushing for certain kinds of rules had their own self-interest uh, uh, in mind as well, and many of those uh, were not necessarily broadly beneficial or indeed even uh, net, net, net gain uh, creating. So I think that was sort of, you know, um, having a, a, a more explicit and better based uh, model of political economy of uh, uh, policy making in the international economy may have been uh, better. Um, the second thing is, is probably, you know, for lack of a better term, I would say a kind of a, a first best uh, mindset. Um, and I think this comes in two variants. Um, the academic version of the uh, first best mindset uh, is that, um, that you, know, you can just assume the uh, other complications and just focus on uh, directly on the 
efficiency consequences. Um, and it's sort of, it's, 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 so you can say you can present the gains from trade or comparative advantage in its, in its own whole um, sort of, you know, glory, but not worry uh, about um, sort of the, uh, you know, the possibility of compensation or the, the public finance complications that might arise as, as a result. Uh, perhaps, you know, the more damaging uh, policymaker version of this uh, is actually much better informed, uh, but I think in some sense worse in practice, because the policymaker version of this is to always insist on a whole long list of complementary reforms, but never actually, A, be clear that you have a closed set of reforms, in other words, whether you've actually specified all the reforms that are actually required, uh, as opposed to an open set where you know, you keep adding onto that complementary list and the laundry list becomes longer and longer. And secondly, um, uh, uh, you know, whether you're actually checking uh, that uh, the, uh, the proposed uh, reforms are actually uh, taking place. So I think we've seen this both in trade openness and in financial openness, and I still see this uh, all, um, all over the place, uh, that you know, the argument that, of course, you know, we never said it was just going to be trade reform, trade opening. We always said that you needed to do this uh, alongside labor market reforms and governance reforms and, and uh, maintaining competitive currencies and all of all the rest. And similarly, of course, you know, the argument uh, that was very actively made um, uh, during the debates on, uh, uh, on the spread of capital account convertibility and financial globalization in the 1990s, always the, the, the insistence uh, on the importance of the complementary uh, reforms, that financial op openness requires appropriate macroeconomic policies um, uh, and, and, and the appropriate prudential regulatory frameworks and, and so forth, so that looking back, uh, we can all say, we warned you all, uh, you didn't, you know, that, that that this was going to be require all kinds of, comp of, of complementary reforms. And the reason that it failed is not that you opened up to financial globalization and all you got was uh, gl uh, volatility and crises, but that you didn't listen to the rest, that you had to do all to take all those other globalizations, um, all the other reforms too. Well, I'll, I'll end with the, the, you know, the I think the, the statement that best characterizes what our attitude to this uh, should be, and this comes from uh, Vinash Tixit, who said the real world is second best at best. Um, and, and that, I think, is, 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 is the right uh, um, sort of kind of attitude that we ought to have, that we can't just assume uh, that it's always going to be somebody else's job uh, to take care of all the side implications uh, of, of the world. And I think um, had we paid a little bit more heed to this, uh, maybe we might have ended up a little bit more on the right side, and I think as a result, maybe have kept a little bit more of the uh, trust of the um, general public. Uh, thank you.